Let's open to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. This evening, we're looking at the, the hinge upon which biblical interpretation rests. If you want to understand all 1,189 chapters of the Bible, uh, the Bible is, is, is a beautiful revelation of the character and of the kingdom and of the redemption of our God. But surrounding that is the way he's going to do that. And it's very hard to understand that if you relegate a lot of the Bible to not mean what it says. So Revelation 20 is the 12th and final promise that God made to Israel. And if you remember, uh, we're looking at the successive promises that God directly, unconditionally made to Israel. And those promises have taken us through a journey that has a lot to do with biblical prophecy. But this evening is really, really the future because... This is paradise coming to earth. In fact, this is what so many groups spend their lives trying to do humanly. They're they're trying to keep all the animals alive and trying to keep all the plants and the trees alive and they want to make the water pure and the air pure. But actually that won't happen until God does it. But there is a utopia coming and we're going to begin on that this evening. But the 12th promise that God made to Israel is this. God promised in his word that Jesus would return as Israel's Messiah. Remember, there's a big difference between the second coming of Christ when he comes as Israel's Messiah and the return of Christ for his, the blessed hope of the saints for his church when he comes to rescue them from the wrath of It's going to be called the time of Jacob's trouble. So remember, Jesus is promised to be returning as Israel's Messiah. Jesus Christ, the pierced Messiah, at his return will rescue the Jews at their darkest hour by fighting for them. When Christ comes for his church, he doesn't fight for them. He just takes them. And that's why it's called the Blessed Hope. But for Israel, he rescues the Jews coming as their warrior in their darkest hour. And finally, as the ultimate, you know, you've heard of the the Jewish prowess and military. We'll wait till the world meets the ultimate Jewish fighter. One man, the God man, takes the whole armies of the world on. But he takes them on as Israel's Messiah. Very interesting to think about how things are shaping up for that. After defeating all of his enemies, after locking up the fiercest adversary, the devil himself, then the Lord allows the Jews to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. That temple becomes a place for all the world to visit. In fact, the scriptures say in the prophets of the Old Testament that during this time, that if you don't come to visit the temple in Jerusalem, then it won't rain on your field. See, God can do that. It's kind of like sprinklers. He can turn them off and it won't rain. It says upon any group of people that don't come and make the pilgrimage during this time of Christ's rule to Jerusalem. And finally, that Jesus Christ, the son of David, will sit as the promised king on the throne of David. Now this is very fitting we talk about this tonight because we sing it. Uh, and, and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David. You ever do that Christmas carol? You remember that? You think about what that's saying. That's saying that Jesus, not David's throne is not in heaven. David's throne is on earth. And Jesus is coming to take his place as the rightful king, the anointed Messiah, promised one, to sit on the throne of his father David. Well, let me just read that again. This is what God promised in his word. Jesus will return as Israel's Messiah. The pierced Messiah will rescue the Jews at their darkest hour after defeating all their enemies and locking up their fiercest adversary, the devil. They will rebuild their temple in Jerusalem for all the world to visit. And finally, Jesus Christ, the son of David, will sit as a promised king on the throne of David. That's one promise, all those pieces. And it's God's final promise to Israel. And God keeps his promises. That multi-part promise that God made and its coming fulfillment is actually the dividing line between 
the two groups within Christendom. Now remember, this is not salvific. This is not determined if you're saved or not. This is kind of like people make choices with the Bible. And some people make choices that, that they, they want to understand everything, and so they keep going until they understand how it's possible that God could say all these things that look like they're paradoxical. The other group just says, anything we don't understand, we're just going to allegorize and make it all to be with the church. And those two groups really divide the church today. I'm talking about professing, confessing Christianity. I'm not talking about cults. I'm talking about within Christendom. So basically... The dividing line between dispensational theology, what's dispensational? That that God has this successive plan and that that plan is going to ultimately go from the church to him returning to his plan with Israel and that there are dispensations that God has within his household of what he's doing. Now basically dispensational theology would be the theology of of Calvary Bible Church and of Dallas Theological Seminary and of Moody Bible Institute and of Chuck Swindoll, of Charles Stanley, of John MacArthur. So you can kind of, if you read books, you kind of figure out what they are. Of the Schofield Study Bible and of the MacArthur Study Bible and of those kind of things. The other side of believing church people would be the covenant theology. That would be the theology of St. Augustine, And the Roman Catholic Church, that's who invented it, St. Augustine. And it's the heartbeat of of what the Roman Catholic Church believes. That, of course, is what one of their uh, finest priests believed. Uh, Martin Luther in the Lutheran churches, that's covenant theology. Uh, John Calvin in the Reformed churches, etc., etc., uh, and you could add to that, you know, R.C. Sproul and D. James Kennedy and all, all those people. So we're talking about believers here. But we're talking about half that believe that God has a promise that he's made to Israel for their Messiah to come and rescue him and to set up his kingdom and sit on that throne. And the others say, well, that's that's not what it sounds like. It means something else. So those are, you could basically divide the church into those two pieces. And each day, with this divide, countless believers of both persuasions, covenant and dispensational theology, all over the earth cry out for Revelation 20 to happen. I don't know if you realize that. In fact, some of you might, even when you're in your car or when you're sitting at a meal or even when you're at a worship service or even at a Bible study, you might cry out for the rule of Jesus Christ as king over all the earth to commence. In fact, most of us know well this cry. In fact, I'm going to start it. See if you can follow along with what, for the last 2,000 years, the born-again, regenerated, believing church of Jesus Christ has cried out to him in the most powerful Greek uh, tenses there can be. They're aorist imperatives, and it means, God, make this happen. Make this happen. You promise, make it happen. See if you can catch this prayer. It goes like this. And and if you know it, you can follow along with me, okay? I'm going to read it. Here it is. Our Father, who art in heaven, do you know it? Say it with me, because we're going to get to the cry for the kingdom. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Whoa! Did you catch that? God, make your kingdom that you promised in one-fifth of the Bible. Your kingdom where the desert will blossom as a rose, where the, the poisonous animals will not be poisonous, serpents and, and spiders will not be poisonous, where the carnivorous will not be carnivorous, where, where there will be no warfare on the planet, where there will only be peace, where everyone will be sitting under their vine, no one will be robbing and pillaging and plundering and raping and murdering. There's going to be a kingdom like that, and it's not in heaven. It's on earth. And that's where all these utopian communes that have sprung up throughout all the centuries, they kind of got a little bit of the truth there. They, They wanted this utopia. But God says, only I can bring it. And I'm going to bring it to instant right here in Revelation 20. So when you pray that, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. You're crying out for God to fulfill that final promise that he made to Israel. 
And you're crying out for Jesus Christ to come as the warring king, the Messiah, to save his people in their darkest hour. I just listed off what almost every minor prophet talks about. If you ever have trouble understanding the minor prophets because you don't realize what they're talking about. They're talking about the literal people of Israel that are in their darkest day because of their persistent rejection. And when they have nowhere else to turn, when they have nowhere else to go, they look up. And as he's coming, they recognize him as the Messiah that 2,000 years ago they pierced on a cross. And it says they sorrow as one who loses their only child. And they wail and weep, realizing that they and their forefathers have rejected him for so long. But he rescues them. Yes, that's the Lord's Prayer he taught to his disciples. And that's been the heart's cry of Christ's church. And that is the call for Christ to return to restore Israel again to the place that God planned and to see Christ sit on the throne of his father David. How fitting at Christmas we should study this because that will jump out of all the Christmas carols to you when you think about this truth. Well, that's what we all long to see happen. And it's the promise of God for the real utopia. And that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, or the disciples' prayer, is uttered by believers who recite what Jesus left us to pray as a model to guide us. And every time we pray those words, we're actually saying, come quickly, overthrow the devil and the kingdoms of this world, and come, Jesus, sit on the throne of David, bless your chosen people of promise, the Jews, and fulfill all those hundreds of promises that you made to them so long ago. Here's just one I'll read to you, and then we'll look at its fulfillment in Revelation. But this is what Isaiah captured. Remember Isaiah's a little Bible in miniature? Isaiah has 39, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are doom and gloom. And it's just judgment and awful stuff. That's Isaiah 1 through 39. Isaiah 40 has who we saw this morning, John the Baptist. This one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's in Isaiah 40. And all the way from 40 to 66, it parallels all of the promises of the New Testament. It has has parts about the spiritual warfare and weapons and the armor Paul talks about. And all that stuff is in Isaiah 40 to 66. And Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like the Bible has 66 books. And the first 39 are like the Old Testament, and the last 27 are like the New. But chapter 65 of Isaiah says this, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now, either that means that uh, wolves and lambs will eat together. Or, I don't know what it means. And either that means lions will eat straw like an ox. That means you'll see carnivorous animals grazing like deer and cow and sheep. Or I'm not sure what it means. Because it's talking about a future time when God rolls back, not removes, but rolls back the effects of the curse. And in the Bible, that's called the kingdom in, in modern language, it's, it's called after the, the word we're going to see six times in what we're reading in Revelation 20. In fact, if you've ever heard of the millennium, you say, oh, that's not in the Bible. No, millennium is not in the Bible. But six times as I read Revelation 20 with you, you're going to see that God promises that he's going to do something for a thousand years. And then he promises he's going to do it for a thousand years. And then he promises he's going to do it for a thousand years. And then he says, when the thousand years I just promised you are past, that I'm going to release the devil that's been chained up for a thousand years because I made a promise that will last for a thousand years. Now, if someone was talking to you, 
that you trusted, and they told you that they were going to do something. They were going to do it for a thousand years, and when the thousand years is over, they're going to do it for a thousand years, but when the thousand years is over, what they promised they'd do for a thousand years, they're going to do for a thousand years. What would you think they meant? Could you say, well, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. It must mean something other than what you're saying, because I don't know if you tell the truth. Or if you just, instead of putting up this grid of that it has to mean anything but what it says, and you just remove that, it makes perfect sense. Revelation 20 is describing the, the new world on this planet that God has planned. Because it's time to focus our attention on the new world that God has planned because this old one is dying. Although this old world is doomed, he has some great plans for the future of planet Earth. God has planned for a whole new world far beyond anything we could ever plan or do. The Lord is preparing to restore an Eden-like paradise on Earth again. And there are dozens of promised changes until the world blossoms like a rose garden with no blight and no bugs. And did you know God promised that that would happen here on earth for a thousand years? Why? Well, because he promised it to Israel, but why? Because God is showing us once and for all that just like two people couldn't make it in a perfect world, The whole world can't make it in a perfect world. And you don't need great societies, and you don't need to knock down all the slums and build fresh new buildings. That doesn't solve our problem because the problem is in a side. And so a perfect world with imperfect people spawns what we're going to read about in Revelation 20. That even though God has rolled back the curse, and there is no danger, and there's no murder, and there's no carnivorous, and no poisonous, and no pollution... In fact, people start living. It says that, that if someone dies at 100, they're like an infant. That Probably most people will live the entire 1,000 years. And they won't need any kind of special health care. God just removes the effects of the curse in causing life to be shortened. But then the ending is so sad. Even at the end, the sinful, unconverted heart As soon as Satan is let out and he gets out of the pit, boom, the whole world joins him in rebelling and marching on God as if they could beat him. Well, Revelation 20, let's read the whole chapter, 1 through 15, and uh, ask the Lord to just open our hearts to these incredible words. Revelation 20, starting in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit. By the way, that pit was in chapter 9, and the devil had the key at that moment, and he opened the pit and let out all those horrible monsters that that are killing all the inhabitants of the earth during the tribulation. But now the angel has that key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold, verse 2, of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. There's the entire history of Satan. He's the dragon that led the rebellion in heaven and took a third of all the angels. He is also the serpent of old that lied to Eden, Eve in the garden and got us into this whole mess as Adam followed her in the disobedience. He is also the devil, the one who was tempting Christ in the wilderness, and he's also Satan, the adversary of the church. So there's his whole life laid out in four words, four descriptions, four titles. And that one, verse 2 says, the angel bound him for... A thousand years. Now you could say, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. So then you keep reading. Verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. Now it's starting to sound like it's a period of time. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on him, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus Christ, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark in their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now you go back and you say, Jesus said something about... The disciples, and they were going to sit on thrones and help him judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And you start saying, I wonder if any of this is connected. And so verse 4 says, they're doing this with Christ reigning, and Jesus is reigning. He's a thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. 
This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Verse 7. Now when the thousand years, do you see how millenarianism or millennial thought came from? Mille is the word for thousand. It's just because it's so many times here, that's where the thought comes from. And so the other, the the covenant people are ah, millennium. They say no thousand years, even though it's in there all those times. They say no, doesn't mean that, something else. But when those thousand years, whatever they are, have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up the breadth of the earth, they surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now that takes us back to earlier in Revelation when the beast and false prophet were cast into the lake of fire and they haven't burned up or been annihilated. Annihilationism is a a view that has sprung up in parts of the church. They say that when you go to hell, you're just burned up. Kind of like bug zappers, you know, those mosquito things like that. No, they're still there. The false, the beast and the false prophet are still alive. They're still in the lake of fire. They're still there. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. That's the bodily resurrection. It's appointed unto man. Hebrews 9, 27 says, once to die, no reincarnation, Oprah, no reincarnation, anybody, once to die, and then right here, the judgment. And the dead were judged, uh, are standing before God. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, verse 12, were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13, what about all the people that sunk in the Titanic and all the people who have been buried at sea and cremated and everything else? You know, their shotgun blasted ashes over the ocean so that God can't get them. Well, verse 13 says, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And that might be a veiled reference to all the people that were drowned and buried in the flood. Because the entire world, except for eight, are under the sea somewhere, or at least stuck at the bottom of some sedimentary rock. So the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Now notice, no one goes to hell because they never heard of Jesus. They go to hell because they're sinners. And Jesus is the only remedy for sin. And they rejected the only remedy. So their works are what they're judged by. And they're found to be a sinner, worthy of eternal death. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is a second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And then chapter 21 starts us in heaven. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your great promise to Israel that they have a future Messiah coming to rescue them, to deliver them, to set them up as the head of the nations, to be the center of the world, to have a temple, to have everybody in the world see this incredible portrait of your sacrifice that was accomplished on the cross. And as the Lord's Supper looks back at the the memorial of what you did on the cross, so the sacrifices of the temple looked forward to it and will once again in the millennium point back to you who gave yourself for sinners. I pray that you would open our hearts to your truth tonight and may we be strengthened and may we comprehend all that you have planned and may it cause us to believe you, trust you, obey and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Real quickly, Revelation 20. Revelation 20 in the next few minutes is a step between earth as we know it and heaven, which is for eternity. And God has an intermediate step. 
He goes between the, the total ravaged earth where half of all the people alive have died, the, they're unburied, and it's just a radiation nightmare with, with all kinds of plagues running rampant and the sun going crazy and the earth, the seas are destroyed, the sea life and everything. And, and Jesus comes down, finishes off the armies, and sets up his kingdom. That's where Revelation 19 ends. But Revelation 20 is the arrival of the golden age. The armies of all the nations are disbanded. The great military academies have fallen into ruin and decay. The machinery of war has been smelted down, as Isaiah says. They've, they've turned their spears into pruning hooks and all the weapons of warfare into plowshares. It's just the whole idea of peace coming and converted into the implements of peace, all that machinery of war. Jerusalem has become the capital of the world. The throne of David is in Jerusalem. The 12 apostles are there judging the 12 tribes of Israel because Israel rules the world. The millennial temple has been built to crown Moriah's brow and the nations of the earth will come there to worship the living God. You say, really? Yeah, that's Isaiah 40, 41, 40, I mean, Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, and 48. That many chapters describing this temple, how the topography changes, where the rivers flow, the water comes out from the altar, the Dead Sea's not dead. Amazing stuff. Prosperity, Isaiah tells us, is evident from pole to pole. Poverty is unknown on earth. Every man has all his heart can desire. There are no prisons, no hospitals, no mental institutions, no barracks, no bars, no brothels, no casinos, no homes for the age or the infirm. Such things are a past and lesser age. Isaiah says the bloom of youth is on everyone's cheek, for a man is a mere infant at a hundred years of age. Isn't that amazing to think about? Kind of like in the pre-flood days cemeteries are crumbling relics of the past tears are rare wolves and lambs calves and lions cows and bears children and scorpions all are at peace jesus has come and the millennium is here the golden age so frequently heralded by the prophets of israel's past has finally dawned and the earth is filled with the knowledge of god as isaiah 2 says as the waters cover the earth, that means it's everywhere, within reach of everyone, and they all are aware of the glory of the Lord. Jesus is Lord. He rules the nations, as Isaiah, or as Psalm 2 says, with a rod of iron. His reign is in righteousness, and the nations obey him. The principles of the Sermon on the Mount are the laws of his kingdom, and men obey them because infractions are not allowed. Sin is dealt with with swift and certain judgment. And this promised era, according to the Old Testament prophets, and according to six times in Revelation 20, this promised era lasts for a thousand years. And so when we pray, thy kingdom come, that is what God has promised. And our hearts respond with the thought that finally, all wrongs are righted, all injustices are stopped, all, all those who don't deserve to have such a hard life don't have it anymore. They all have health, they have food, they have peace. It's kind of like what everyone has wished for. But immediately, how do we get from where we are today to that point? Think about it. Persia or Iran, today it was announced, they're starting 10 more places to enrich uranium. I mean, wow, they have a lot of electrical needs, even though they have the second largest stockpile of oil and gas in the whole world, the second highest proven reserves. They still need to have all this uranium for peaceful electric you know, generation. Uh, amazing. So how do we get from Persia or Iran, the ancient foe of Israel, assembling nuclear weapons as fast as possible, and with 1.2 billion Muslims who are at the core of their belief system, they want to annihilate Israel and subjugate the West? Remember that. That is at the core. No matter how many peace-loving Islamic people you say there are, the core of the Koran is that Jews and Christians, Jews annihilated Christians subjugated. Did you know Switzerland is voting right now? They're going to stop letting them build mosques in Switzerland? It's the first European country with some sense. They're finally seeing what's happening. 
that that the Quran says wherever the call of the of the prayer tower is that Allah controls that land and so there at least Switzerland's not going to let them do that anymore but how do we go from that to paradise with Christ ruling on the earth well to get there we need a jet tour of biblical prophecy and to do that, we need to back up to chapter 19. So look over, I'm going to give you uh, kind of a thumbnail sketch. Now you might want to jot these down because what's so amazing about biblical prophecy is that the book of Revelation is kind of like a, a switchboard. My father-in-law used to work for AT&T. He was a man who, who brought the wires into the switchboards before they all became digital. And every telephone <clears throat> telephone out there had a line coming, and that line met at this this little c- cement block or brick building, and all those connections were made in there, and, and you could, at the board, ha- look at and touch and listen to any telephone within that, that exchange. Well, did you know that's how the, the book of Revelation is? Only the book of Revelation is the switchboard for the whole Bible. And though it only has 404 verses, it has over eight hundred quotes, allusions, and references to every other book in the Bible. It's the switchboard. It alludes to everything that God has said is going to happen, and it puts it all into this this incredible apocalyptic vision. And so, when we pray, thy kingdom come, our true meaning is, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And the, the coming of Christ is precipitated by a crisis. And that's what chapter 19 is going to tell us about, especially starting in verse 11. Um, the, the writers of prophetic literature have written this about the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. It says that the distinction of Thy Kingdom Come is supported by the Greek text of Christ's prayer. Each of the petitions in the Lord's Prayer concerning God's name, His kingdom, and His will have a Greek verb that is not only the emphatic position, that means the place position in the sentence, but also the aorist imperative form, thus indicating a single or instantaneous action. So the Lord's Prayer harmonizes all of the Old Testament prophecies and said that God is going to instantaneously in a, in a, in a precipitous way because of a, a major event that occurs, he's going to cause his kingdom to come. And that's what we read about. The crisis and the kingdom that follows it is revealed to us in Revelation 19. And I want to show you the remarkable plan God has written. You know, I think it's just it's so amazing. You know, um, the Israelis are writing a plan right now for if they get attacked by all their enemies at once. And uh, they're really concerned about that because there are thirty or 40,000 missiles up in the north right now in Lebanon. And Syria has who knows how many. The Lord knows. And they've smuggled all those into the Gaza Strip. And now they're putting them in the West Bank. And, of course, Iran has their long-range ones. And... They have their little submarines they're running around with. And so Israel's got a battle plan. They've got a battle plan if they are simultaneously attacked by air forces, missiles, tanks, and seaborne, uh, you know, adversaries, how they're going to do that. And, and they've been working on it for weeks now. It's been in the news that they're planning with all this, you know, America helping them, Juniper, Cobra, and all this stuff. We've got 19 of our warships all positioned off there, linked with them, because we're going to help them, supposedly. Um, how are they going to do? They have a plan. Well, look, this is God's plan. It's much better than their plan, okay? God's plan is this. Starting in Revelation 19.11, we have the return of Christ, the King of Kings. And we're going to walk through those verses. Then we have the judgment of Satan. That's the first three verses of chapter 20. So the return of the king. I remember when that movie came out, The Return of the King. I thought, no, it's the return of a king. The king has not come yet, you know. And he's, he's much more powerful than the Lord of the Rings king. But the return of the king is in the last verses of chapter 19. He restrains Satan. That's the first three verses of chapter 20. And then the rule of Christ as Messiah in the millennium is Revelation 20 verses 4 through 10. So there's three things. Return, restraint, and his rule. And it's a beautiful progression there. Now, now how we know that this is not 
allegorical or figurative is that John keeps saying, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. And what we see is that it's, it's a chronological event he's seeing unfold from the return of Christ all the way through heaven. So the Apostle John and others vividly show us these three points, the return, the restraint, and finally the rule. And I would like to just link together with you from Revelation 1911 onward all of the other scriptures. I'm actually going to read them to you, and and I'll give you the reference if you want to look them up. But here are the elements of Christ's return. Revelation 19, 11 through the end through 21 talks about this. But here's what all the other prophets add. It's kind of like uh, when you have uh, surround sound. You know, if you get one of those home theaters, you know, and spend tens of thousands of dollars to watch worthless movies, you know, in your home. One of those things, you know, a surround sound theater. A friend of mine just got one, and it was so amazing. Uh, I was sitting in his big stuffed leaning back chair. It was really nice. He has a popcorn machine in there and a big uh, thing full of sodas and and each chair is individual and it leans back and you have places to put all your food. Boy, that's a great weight loss place. You can go and sit there and watch the movies. But I was sitting there, he was showing it off to me and all of a sudden I heard something behind me. I actually turned and it was, you could hear the movie, the airplane was behind you. It was going like that because he's got so many speakers. But when he pulled out the cords, you could only hear the sound from the front. It was real boring. And you know what? Without all the other scriptures, we look at Revelation, we're trying to figure it out because we're only hearing the sound from the front. But if you work in the surround sound of all the prophets, the minor and major prophets, and you put all those in, you can hear it coming from behind you. And that's what we'll do. Number one, Matthew tells us, in Matthew 24, 30, that the return of the king in Revelation 19.11 is preceded by the heavens opening and the sign of the Son of Man appears. Now, we're not sure what that is. But he said, people are going to look up, and when they see the sign of the Son of Man. You know all these disaster movies, how the people look up and they see the, you know, that burning asteroid coming toward them or whatever? You know, I, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but the whole world is going to be gripped. And this is what Matthew says. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear, Matthew twenty four thirty, in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So John, in Revelation, adds that the Lord comes, and in 1911, look what it says, he comes in the sky flying like a rider on a white horse, accompanied by the armies of heaven. And John tells us, out of it, he sees and he says, out of his mouth goes forth a sharp two-edged sword. He comes as king of kings in the wrath of God Almighty. Now, I'll read that. 1911, now I saw the heaven opened. Matthew adds, you know, this sign. And behold, a white horse. That's what John adds, because he's seeing it. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Remember I told you the ultimate Jewish fighting machine is Jesus. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. We already saw that in chapter 1. You know, this burning laser-like eyes in Revelation 1 where he's searching us. Well, those same flaming eyes, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on him that no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now, for us, we think, oh, you know, worthy is the lamb that was slain. But actually, that's not what it's fully talking about because Isaiah 63 tells us that his robe is dipped in blood because he is trampling out mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord he is trampling out the grapes of wrath remember that that whole story that comes from Isaiah 63 that says Christ is coming and smashing you know the liberals don't like that to have Jesus have that you know he's coming and smashing his enemies like trotting a wine vat. You know how they do that? They hold on and they jump up and down in the, in the grapes and squash them. That's why he has got this, this splashed, and we'll read that just a little bit from Isaiah. But he's coming with this, this garment uh, dipped 
in blood. And his name is called the word of God in verse 14. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them. Oh, there comes Psalm 2 with a rod of iron. Remember, that's the promise. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus is the one to whom judgment has been delegated within the Trinity. And he comes and executes the wrath of God against the rebels, those who have rejected him and denied him and ignored him and were acquainted with him and never believed in him personally. And he has on his robe, verse 16, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thirdly, if you look at verse 15, this, this rod of iron is, is, is how he's going to rule. So he's coming to earth to rule. He's coming to earth to fulfill all those promises, and the promise is Psalm 2.9. And it says this in Psalm 2.9, You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That speaks of his iron rod rule. No rebellion allowed on earth. During the millennium, Christ is ruling with a rod of iron. And anyone that rebels, and so rebellion is quite limited. And forced Attendance at the temple is quite followed through with. You, you are sitting under your vine, you have your field, it, it seems like it's almost like everybody's living in a garden, and you're, Isaiah says your little part of the garden, you don't have underground sprinkling, you have above ground sprinkling from heaven. And if you don't come to the temple, poof, no rain. So you go to the temple, so it'll rain. But see, it's kind of like forcing kids to go to church. There's no heart change. And that's the problem of the millennium. God is showing that without him doing supernatural heart surgery and making people born again, they are just externally conforming and never internally transformed. Um, Revelation 19, 13, look at this. It says he's clothed with a robe uh, dipped in blood. And Isaiah 63 explains that. And let me read it to you because Isaiah explains this robe dipped in blood and the treading out the wine press. And this is what Isaiah 63 says, verses 1 through 6. Who is this who comes from Edom? Remember, Edom is east of Israel. Edom is where Esau settled. When he separated from Jacob, Israel, he went east into Edom, into the Petra. If you've ever heard of Petra, it's in Jordan today and goes down into the Saudi Arabia area. And that's Edom is where he's coming from. With dyed garments, Isaiah 63 says, from Basra. This is one who is glorious in his apparel. He's traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness am mighty to save. And so Isaiah says, why is your apparel red, verse 2, and your garments like one who treads a winepress? And Jesus says, verse 3 of Isaiah 63, I have trodden the winepress alone, And from the peoples no one was with me. I have trodden them in my anger. I have trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments. And I have stained all my robes. Verse 4. For the day of vengeance is on my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. Do you see why he comes back? He's coming back to save his people. His chosen people. The year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered if there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me. My own fury had sustained me. Verse 6, I have trodden down the peoples in my anger. I have made them drunk in my fury. I brought down their strength to the earth. Now, if you look at Revelation 19, where you are, look at verse 15. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. So see, Isaiah 63 gives us a big snapshot of where it is and what he's doing, and John just says he's doing it. Well, Micah adds to this that he is coming like one who is threshing a harvest floor. 
And this is what Micah 4 and verses 12 and 13 say. That, and by the way, all this is happening, just for you to see. Uh, Matthew tells us that the heavens are open, the sign of the Son of Man appeared. John adds that the Lord comes through the sky as a rider on a white horse. He has the armies of heaven, and he has out of his mouth this two-edged sword, and he's coming in the wrath of God Almighty. Uh, he has this rod of iron, his garments are uh, dipped in blood, and he's trotting out the wine press. So that's what we've already seen. But Micah adds this. He says, Micah four twelve and 13, But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Remember, this is in the context of the final battle, Armageddon. That's, that's what's going on. Uh, actually, it starts back in chapter 16. And uh, at the end of 16, starting in verse 17 of Revelation, uh, the earth is shaken and, and they're all gathering uh, together in verse 16 of chapter 16 to the place called Armageddon. So all the nations of the world, all the armies come, and it says in Micah, I've gathered them to Armageddon like sheaves to the threshing floor. Verse 13 of Micah 4, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze, and you shall beat in pieces many people. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. So he's saying, you're going to triumph. I'm going to thresh them in my judgment. Now Jesus said this, Matthew 3.12. So this is how amazing it is if you put all these allusions together. Uh, I mean, John the Baptist said this about Jesus. He said, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn and he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. See, John the Baptist was seeing the the... Christ returning in his fierce anger, and he's describing that. And then Joel, the prophet, as well as John in Revelation, that he is one who's reaping as with a sickle of divine judgment. This is how Joel puts it. Joel 3.13, put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full, the vats are overflowing, for their wickedness is great. And you say, well, how do you know that that's talking about the end? Because the whole book of Joel is about the day of the Lord. And if you ever read the Old Testament, you find that day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is this time of him coming and judging the earth just before he rescues Israel. As long as you're in Revelation, back up to chapter 14, let me show you something, because here's another uh, piece that goes right with Joel. Revelation 14, verses 17 and 18 then another angel, Revelation fourteen seventeen says, came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also, having a sharp sickle. Verse 18, and another angel came from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine to the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now keep turning over to Revelation Uh, chapter uh, 19. Look at the end of what that says in 1915. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, if you just flip back and forth between 14, 18, and it says, thrust your sharp sickle, the vine, the grapes are fully ripe, and and this winepress is ready, you see this, this picture Of all the nations gathered to the threshing floor like sheaves, all of them like grapes put in a wine press, and then you overlay that with Isaiah 63, and you see Jesus is the one coming with the sickle, coming with the sledge to to thresh the wheat, coming to the wine press to trample it. And that's why he has the blood-splattered garments. Well, what, what do the people, how, how do they respond to all this? And that's what's so amazing. It, if you're in chapter 19, it says that, that the heavens open in verse 11 and the, the people are, are there on earth and they're watching him breaking through the sky. And verse 16 says of 19, he is got this king of kings and lord of lords. So what do the people do? Well, there's a lot of description of that, and I'll just read these to you. It says in Matthew 24, 30, uh, the despised Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth again appears, and when he does, the people start wailing. 
you know, they don't like Jesus as it is. But when he comes, this is what it says. This is what Jesus said in Matthew twenty four thirty. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So Jesus preached this, what it's in Revelation. He preached it in Matthew 24. And Joel puts it this way, Joel one fifteen. Alas, for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. So the day of the Lord, Joel one fifteen says, is a day of destruction. Now do you see why dispensationalists say there's two comings of Christ? The one coming is comfort. And it's we're gathered in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and to stay with him. The second coming, we're already with him. And we're coming on horses like armies from heaven. And he puts his fierce anger and tramples out all of the judgment on the earth. There's just such a disparity between them. The one he's in the clouds, the other his feet finally touch down in the Mount of Olives. The other is is comfort and those who meet him in the air go off to this banquet. The other one is judgment and, and all this doom. It says in Amos uh, 5.20, there's more about this. It says, is not the day of the Lord, remember, day of the Lord is code for this, this tribulation wrath, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? It is not very dark. It has no brightness in it. And, and the prophets talk about during this time of Christ's return that the whole earth is plunged into this kind of twilight. And it's just kind of like not light, not night. It's just kind of, it's eerie. And nothing is normal. Uh, things we could count on. Uh, Isaiah 13, 13 uh, exactly parallels this, and it says uh, that God's fierce anger is expressed through Christ. And this is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 13. I will shake the heavens. The earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. If you've ever been in an earthquake, it's very unsettling to have the earth move out of its place. Bonnie and I live through you know, different quakes when we lived in Los Angeles. And I remember our first quake, what you're supposed to do in Los Angeles is you're supposed to stand in a doorway. You know, in Oklahoma, you get in the bathtub with your mattress. That's tornado practice. In California, you stand in the doorway because a doorway protects you because of the framing. Well, not me. I ran outside. I wanted to see it. And so as soon as the the dishes started falling off the wall, Bonnie said, stand in the doorway. And I said, I'm running out to see it. I don't want to miss it. So we dragged Johnny out and we went to see it. And we stood on our street. And by the way, Goofy from Disney lived next door to us. Goofy, the voice of Goofy. And he had all those platinum records. He a, was an actor and, and had all this wealth. And all of his platinum records were flying off the wall. And, and I looked down past Goofy's house and, and Dom DeLuise's nephew and all those that were down that way. And it was the most amazing thing. It was like, it was like waves. And, and the chimneys of all the houses went like this. It's the most, I mean, it was like riding a surfboard. It was the most amazing thing. The whole ground just, just did ripples up and down, and things started cracking and falling and breaking and everything. And, and it was only a four point whatever. And this is going to be like a 20 on the Richter scale. It's going to be so massive it's that all the islands are going to drop out of sight in the ocean and cities are going to be split and all that. But, but it says, in Amos, I mean, in, in Isaiah thirteen thirteen, the earth will move out of her place. You know, the recent disaster Mayan movie that just came out, 2012, it says that the whole earth moves. Well, they got that right. It does. Because God said it's going to in Isaiah 13, 13. It'll be a great and terrible day of judgment. Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's going to be great. It's going to be dreadful. It's going to cause horror. It says in Joel 2.2, 2, it's a day of darkness, gloominess, clouds, and thick darkness. And it says that it'll be like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, people great and strong like they've never seen before. There will be never any day like this after, even for many generations. Zechariah 14.6 says it will come to pass in that day there'll be no light, and all the lights will diminish. 
So that means that the sun is obscured. It means the stars and the moon are obscured. And even natural light seems to be, you just can't seem to turn the lights on. You can't get anything to be bright enough. It'll just be a terrible time. As long as you're in Revelation, back up to chapter 6, I want you to see where John picks up. He says this in Revelation 6, real quickly. Um, in, in verse 15, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in caves and the rocks of the mountains. So they're running for the hills. It says in Revelation 6.15, and they will hide in the caverns and the rocks and the holes of the earth. You know, when the huge tornado came through in 99 in Oklahoma, people were just going into drain pipes. It was, it was an F5, and it was just took away a whole mall right by where we were. We, it just, we drove down the road, and the whole mall was gone. It was just a flat slab. It was the most amazing power display. Well, as that's happening in the tribulation, people are crawling in the drain pipes and going in the sewers anywhere they can. Isaiah adds this in Isaiah 2.19. They will go into the holes of the rocks. They will go into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord, from the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. So there's this earthquake thing. And then Jesus said this. In Luke twenty three thirty, then they will begin to say to the mountains, "Fall on us," and to the hills, "Cover us." I mean, they're laying down in the ditches, saying, "Please cover us. We don't want to see God. Please fall on us. We don't want to see His face." And look at Revelation six sixteen, and they said to the mountains and rocks, "Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb." And if you turn over to chapter 9 and verse 6, look, look at just another insight. It says, In these days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. See, there's no escape. You can't escape the wrath of God. Well, before we go, three lessons to go home with. Okay? Why does God have all this stuff? Does it scare us to death? I thought we weren't going to be here. Why should we even care? Because God wants to show us three things. Number one, God cares. God is genuinely interested in this world, its needs, its inhabitants, now as well in the future. It says in Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16 that he cares, and he wants us to come to his throne of mercy to find help in time of need. In fact, the plan of salvation in in Romans 10 that says, whoever calls in the name of the Lord, that verse is right out of the minor prophets, right out of the time of tribulation, and to the end... God is saying to all those people that are getting mowed down and squashed and melted and, and you know, everything that's happening to them, it says, if any of them will call in the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. But they won't. Even when the whole world is falling apart, the hardened, sin-darkened hearts say, no, anything but you, God. You say, oh, that's foolish. Watch out. That's what sin does to you. You play with sin, it hardens your heart. Until you can have God pulling the carpet out from you and you say, no. Number two, not only does God care, God controls. God has not lost control. He is sovereign. He's working things together for good, even now as well as in the future. So the Lord knows where all ten of the enrichment sites are in Iran. If he wants the Israelis to bomb them, they will. If he wants America to bomb them, they will. And if he doesn't want them to, they won't. He's in control. He raises up even presidents, governors. He even controls city council decisions and and town ordinances and everything else. He's in control. Now, we have our part, but he has not lost control yet and never will. And finally, what's amazing is the God who cares, the God who controls is the God who communicates. The God we serve is not a God of silence. He does not want to leave us in the dark. He lets us know what's going to happen down to some very minute details. And if you will say to him, Open my eyes that I can behold wonderful things out of your truth. He'll open your eyes and let you see him in his word. I hope you make place in your schedule for the Lord. Let's pray to the Lord what he told us to pray. And let's do the whole thing with that thy kingdom come right in the middle. Now that you know what the kingdom coming means. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Every time you pray the Lord's prayer, you're saying come and trample out the vintage of your wrath. Wow. But before he does that, he told us to go and tell every creature 
the good news that you don't have to get trampled, that someone got trampled in your place. It's so simple. Most people say, I, don't, I just can't get that. But if they will by faith, they'll be saved. Let's bow together and pray to the Lord the prayer he told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.